Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. And Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study on the road to Calvary. This is book two, We Would See Jesus. Now, we are going to be in part six today, which is titled Sinai or Calvary. It would seem from what we have read in the foregoing chapter that it is simplicity itself for us to enter by the door, which is the Lord Jesus. However, Satan knows how to beset us round with subtle difficulties when, under conviction of sin and out of touch with God, we would long to find peace and freedom. Therefore, before going on to consider that into which the door leads us, we must pause in this chapter to try to help the convicted soul in some of the battles that go on in his heart just outside the door. Whenever a sense of sin lies upon our conscience, two persons, it seems, fight to get hold of that conviction, the devil and the Holy Spirit. The devil wants to get hold of it in order to take it and us to Sinai and there condemn us and bring us into bondage. The Holy Spirit, however, wants to take us and our sin to Calvary, there to bring us through the door into peace and freedom. These two places represent for us the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is the covenant of law, and the other, the covenant of grace, wrought out and sealed for us by the death of the Lord Jesus on Calvary. The devil seeks to take us to the one and the Holy Spirit to the other. Put like that, the issue seems simple. But in practice, the mischievous thing is that the devil often simulates the voice of the Holy Spirit in order that the uninstructed Christian will think it is God who is taking him to the place of condemnation and bondage, and that, therefore, he must follow. Mount Sinai was, of course, the historical place where God gave the Ten Commandments. You'll find this in Exodus chapter 20. Ten times God spake out of the cloud and fire, and each time it was to announce a great moral commandment binding upon man, Thou shalt, and thou shalt not. There, the basic covenant of law was given by which man's relationship with God was to be governed. Put quite simply, it was, This do, and thou shalt live. And this fail to do, and thou shalt die. That is still the covenant that the heart of man finds it easiest to understand, and to which his conscience most readily responds. In ordinary life today, it represents for us the whole system of moral and religious standards that each man has worked out for himself as a result of the moral light which has played upon his life from various sources. Now, when a sense of failure of some sort lies upon the conscience, the devil immediately endeavors to take us to the law, that which we have called in this study Sinai. In order to accuse us with regard to the standards we have adopted there, but which we have failed to keep. The higher our moral and spiritual standards, the more there is for the devil to accuse us. He is rightly called the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12.10 He not only accuses us to God, but he accuses the Christian to himself. And he does so by pointing to all the matters, real or imaginary, in which the Christian is failing to keep the law which he has espoused and he thus produces in him a sense of condemnation. This is what the psychiatrist diagnoses in his neurotic patient as a guilt complex. But it is also something that many a healthy-minded Christian carries around with him all too often. The source of it all is the devil, and that which gives strength to his accusations is clearly the law. This sheds light on Paul's words, the strength of sin is the law, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty six. These accusations have usually two effects upon the Christian, and they are precisely the effects which the devil designs to produce within us. First, 
they cause us the reaction of self-excuse. In the epistle to the Romans, there is a statement that says, their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Romans 2.15 To excuse ourselves and to assert our innocence is ever the natural reaction to accusation. And this is exactly what the devil wants us to do. By his accusations, he has provoked us to try to stand before God on the ground of our own righteousness and innocence. And he knows, and we ought to know too, that there is nothing for us on that ground. All that God has for sinners, he has for them on the condition that they will acknowledge that that is what they really are. And so our thoughts go round and round, one half of us accusing ourselves and the other half excusing ourselves. And all the time that we are thus excusing ourselves, we are getting further and further from the grace of God and from his peace. This was precisely the effect that the accusations of his friends had on Job. In suggesting that his trials came as a result of some wrong in him, they provoked him to assert vigorously his innocence. And on that ground, he found that God fought against him. Upright man that he really was, he had nonetheless to be broken to accept the sinner's place before he could be at peace with God again. The second effect of the devil's accusations is to cause us to get onto the ground of self-effort and striving. He tells us what we are not in order to get us to struggle in our own strength to make up for it. He accuses us that we are not praying enough or not speaking enough to others of their need of Christ or not giving enough to God or that we are not humble enough and so on simply in order to get us to attempt to do all those things in the energy of self. The whole purpose of the devil in these accusations is to get us into striving and self-effort and thus into real bondage. In that condition, he has got us trying to climb up some other way, into blessing, and a hard, painful business it is for the wall is high. Instead of entering in by the door, upon street level, and he can do all this under the guise of being the voice of God to us. But he is a liar and the father of it, John 8, 44. His accusations, though they have the appearance of truth and of being based on the law of God, are but half-truths and all the more dangerous for that reason. How we need to discern the voice of the devil and to know and experience God's answer to the thunderings of Mount Sinai against us. It is to reveal just that to us, that the Holy Spirit has come. If the devil wants to reach that sense of sin that lies upon our conscience, so does the Holy Spirit. But how differently the Holy Spirit works. He takes that sin and us with it to Calvary, to Jesus our door. There he shows us that the sin and much else was anticipated and settled by the Lord Jesus in his death upon the cross. Whether what the devil says to us is true or false is all settled by the Lord Jesus for us. The worst that the devil can say about us is not to be compared to the dark depths of sin that swept over him there. At the cross, the most self-condemned finds nothing but forgiveness, cleansing, and comfort. The fact, then, that we are the sinners we are, of which the devil loves to accuse us, is only a half-truth. The other half of the truth is that Jesus died for us and did a complete work for us. That is something the devil never tells us. Only the gentle Holy Spirit tells us that. Indeed, it is his great delight to comfort all that mourn, and to do so by giving us a fresh sight of Jesus and his blood, and of his appearing even now in the presence of God for us. This revelation has two effects on the believer when he truly sees it, the exact opposite of the two effects of the accusations of Satan, which have already been mentioned. First, he freely acknowledges his sin and judges himself. 
If the accusations of Satan had the effect of causing him to excuse himself and to protest his innocence, the grace of God revealed at Calvary has the effect of causing him to admit his sin. He is not even at too great pains to sort out what may be a true accusation and what may be false. The answer in the blood of Christ is the same in either case. Furthermore, if he could regard himself innocent on one score, there are many others on which he is hopelessly guilty. In any case, it ill befits him to be attempting to prove his innocence on even one point before the cross where the fully just died as the fully unjust for him. Thus there is produced in him that attitude of heart which in the sight of God is of great price the attitude of the broken and contrite heart. The moment he adopts this attitude, he is brought right on to redemption ground, where nothing but grace is lavished upon him by God. Second, the sight of Calvary and its meaning for him provokes him not only freely to admit his sin, but also to rest from self-initiated activity to get himself right. Perhaps no verse expresses more clearly this effect of our coming to the cross than one in Isaiah when it says, In returning and rest shall ye be saved. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 15. The situation in this chapter of Isaiah was that Israel was in a serious plight, with her enemies descending on her from the north. In this plight, she resorted to alliances with other nations in particular with Egypt, to whom she sent her ambassadors for help. Into this scene, Isaiah steps with the word, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. He declares that the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose, for the root cause of their predicament is their departure from the Lord. It is for this cause that God has brought upon them the armies of Babylon, that he might humble and chasten them. He therefore calls upon them to return to the Lord in repentance. To this, the people might well have replied, to return to the Lord is all very well. But what relevance has it to a situation like ours in which we are besieged by our foes? And Isaiah would doubtless have said, it has every relevance, for in dealing with your wrong relationship with God, you are dealing with the root cause of all your present troubles. But, they might have replied, what are we to do about the armies of Babylon? Isaiah would have said, if you return to the Lord, you can rest about that, for God will never fail to work for those who have having repented rest in quiet confidence in his overruling and restoring grace. This, then, is something of the background and meaning of this great word to them, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. The same word is for us, too. Having returned, that is, having repented, we can rest, and we can do so because we see that Jesus has done a finished work for us on the cross. We can rest first about our righteousness, which has received such a damaging blow both in our eyes and in the eyes of others by the sin that we are having to repent of. We see that the precious blood of Jesus has anticipated and settled the very sin we are confessing and has provided a perfect righteousness for us before God, and we can rest content to have none other before men. Indeed, it is not until we are content to have no other righteousness before both God and men that we find peace. But then, when we do, what rest is ours from futile efforts to justify ourselves? We can say, if others think me a failure, they think the truth. But a failure who has found peace through the blood of his cross, and we are prepared to give them just that testimony. We have learnt at last to overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, Revelation 12:11. And then our hearts are made free. We stand before God and move amongst men with the witness, this is all my righteousness, 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. More than that, having returned, we can rest about the consequences of our sin and about the situation in which it may have involved us. Up to the moment of our repentance, the situation in which we have involved ourselves is our responsibility. We have made our bed and we must lie in it, or more likely, do our frenzied best to get ourselves out of it. But the moment we repent and put the blame where it belongs on ourselves, the all-availing blood of Jesus comes into view on our behalf before God, and he then is pleased for Christ's sake to make the tangled situation his own responsibility, and we can rest about it. He first gives the repentant one peace through the blood, and then deals with his situation. As someone has said, God forgives the messer and unmesses the mess, or rather, he makes the mess the raw material for a fresh purpose of love. This is the vision of grace which was given Jeremiah as he watched the potter at work. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. When the potter saw the vessel marred in his hand, he might well have discarded it. Instead, he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. So does God delight to do with all our marred vessels when we truly humble ourselves. Be the marred vessel our whole life or just a day in that life. Be it a complex set of circumstances or just a relationship with one other person which we have spoiled. And as we rest as repentant ones at the cross and take whatever steps he may show us to be necessary, we watch him bringing a new purpose to birth. His order comes out of our chaos, and we are left with nothing but adoring praise to him. The new purpose he works may not be unmixed with discipline, but grace assures us it is going to be one of infinite good, and so we rest. So it is that the value of the blood of Christ extends not only to our sin, but also to the circumstances connected with our sin. This is a sight of the power of the blood of Christ, which brings infinite relief and peace to the tortured, remorseful soul, and which causes him to rest indeed from his anxieties to prove the grace of his wonderful God. The same word of rest applies to our dealing with the qualities we know we lack in our lives. We are convicted that we lack love for somebody, or that we lack faith in a certain matter, or that we have been prayerless. As we have seen, the devil wants to accuse us of these things in order to provoke us to strive to make up for them in our own strength. But the Holy Spirit takes us with our conviction to Calvary to provoke us to repent about them and then rest about them. Knowing that we are not loving towards somebody, we try to be more loving. Aware that we lack faith in a matter, we struggle to trust more. Convicted that we have not been praying as we should, we make resolutions as to how long we shall spend on our devotions each day in the future. The trouble with all this is that it is we who are doing it all and it is not the work of Christ. As we know, or we ought to know, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Romans 7, 18. We can be almost certain that very little will come from it. The Holy Spirit, however, is not concerned primarily to get us to try to be better, but to repent deeply of the sin there is not to try to be more loving to that person, but to repent of having been jealous and critical towards him, and so on. Then, having repented, the Holy Spirit would bid us rest as sinners at the cross, where sin is cleansed away, and so be at peace. As we rest as sinners in that low place, Jesus pours into our hearts his own love for that other person a love that will sometimes send us to that person to put things right with them. And he gives us a forbearance towards them that was never there before. In that low place where we confess our worry, he gives us his own faith, the faith of the Son of God. There too, he will lead us to those devotions which he wants on each occasion. 
So it is. Instead of trying to climb up some other way into victory, we enter in by the door as we bow in repentance at his cross. In this way, we find the reality of not I, but Christ who lives in me. For it is into his love, patience, and victory that we enter, not our own. An illustration will help at this point to make clear the application of the principles involved in the words, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. At a certain place in East Africa, which had been a very real center of revival, a time of spiritual coldness had come, and the one-time joyous testimony seemed to have died from among the fellowship of those who met there. This was known and acknowledged by the Christians, but the spiritual famine seemed to continue. Then there came among them an African Christian from another part, a man full of zeal, and one who thought he knew all the answers. He charged them with their coldness and said, Little wonder when the township next to you is completely pagan and you are doing nothing to preach the gospel there. He urged them to get busy and conduct open air meetings there. A godly leader in the local group answered him with great wisdom along these lines. You are quite right, we are cold. We have acknowledged that to God and have been repenting. But we are not going to start striving to do this or that to bring the blessing back. Not even street preaching. Having repented, we are going to rest as sinners under the blood of Jesus until God is pleased to meet us again. Sure enough, God soon met them. And the Holy Spirit began to work again in their midst. And each was able to praise again for fresh sights of Jesus. Their cups were so full that when they went to that pagan township to make their purchases, they could not but witness of Jesus to those they met in the shops and elsewhere. And ere long, a man was saved, and then another, and then another. And a work of grace began in that place. Thus they discovered the efficacy of the way of repentance and rest, for it brought Jesus himself into their situation. And they were enabled to take that way only because they saw the efficacy of his finished work on the cross for them. How differently then does the Holy Spirit work from the devil? While Satan accuses only to bring despair, bondage, and striving, the Holy Spirit convicts only to bring comfort freedom, and rest. Indeed, it is by discerning this fact that we can learn to distinguish between the accusing of Satan and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If the reproof is of a nagging nature, that is blaming without any end to it, and if it is a vague and general reproof rather than clearly specific, then we may know it to be, as a rule, the accusation of Satan. If the reproof is clear and specific, and if we instinctively know that we have only to be willing to say yes and repent to have peace and comfort, then we may be assured that it is the voice of the gracious Holy Spirit, and we may safely obey his convictions and turn to Calvary. Under the law, with its tenfold lash, learning, alas, how true that the more I tried, the sooner I died, while the law cried, you, you, you. Hopelessly still did the battle rage, O wretched man, my cry. And deliverance I sought by some penance bought, while my soul cried, I, I, I. Then came a day when my struggling ceased, and trembling in every limb, at the foot of the tree, where one died for me, I sobbed out, him, 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 as he wills. And until next time, friends, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.